Hey, what's up, guys? Today, I'll show you a disaster drama film, The Cassandra Crossing. Spoiler ahead, watch out and take care. The movie begins inside the International Health Organization located in Geneva. Three terrorists infiltrate the building by pretending to be medical staff members reeling in an injured patient. They successfully breach into the U.S. department section, but a guard stops them from entering. The terrorists shoot the guard and then proceed further into the U.S. section. The guard kills one of the three terrorists. The remaining two terrorists plant the bomb, while the wounded guard crawls his way to the security panel and presses the alarm system. Two guards arrive at the crime scene and corner the two terrorists. The two terrorists search for an escape route, and the only plausible way out is through a laboratory. One guard disables the bomb, while the other continuously fires his gun. As the bullets fly across the hallway, the bullets hit one of the terrorists in a glass container containing an unknown liquid. The liquid explodes and splashes at the two terrorists. The wounded terrorist falls, while the remaining terrorist escapes through a window. Later on, the U.S. government sends a military intelligence colonel to deal with the attempted bombing. He meets the doctor in charge, who's supervising the wounded terrorist and a major, who's assigned to translate and radio communication. They identify the wounded terrorist as a local in Switzerland. The major tries communicating with him in Swedish, but there's no response. The terrorist only displays chilling, blisters on the body, chapped and dry lips, skin discoloration, and inability to speak. Doctor questions Colonel about the existence of such bacteria inside the U.S. department because she suspects the U.S. is using it as a biological weapon. But Colonel reasons that they've been simply trying to find ways to destroy it. Shortly, the wounded terrorist dies, and Colonel orders Doctor and the Major to burn the body. Afterward, they search the terrorist's wallet and see a ticket for a train to Stockholm. Then they identify the third terrorist as Eklund. Meanwhile, Eklund runs to Transcontinental Express Station. He sneaks into the train storage room, hoping no one spots him. Transcontinental Express offers second and first class seats for their passengers. The conductor warmly welcomes the boarding passengers. Among the passengers is a neurosurgeon named Chamberlain, his ex-wife Jennifer, a rich lady and her young lover, Navarro, who carries their dog. Eventually, each passenger rides the same train where Eklund hides. Meanwhile, he shivers in the baggage car, and due to thirst, he drinks water out of a dog's food bowl. The dog licks his hands when he returns it back to the cage. In Geneva, Colonel invites Doctor to the U.S. Department office. He asks for help on how to deal with the loose plate carrier, and Doctor quickly suggests stopping the train and bringing Eklund into the building. However, Colonel fears Eklund might have made contact with other people already. The Major enters the office to report that no recent passenger rode a plane, and no patient admitted to any hospital that fits Eklund's description. Therefore, the possible location where Eklund hides is on the train. Afterward, the Major displays on the vector screen the railway map. The train is currently halfway before reaching Basel Station. Doctor then asks why they can't just stop the train, but then the Major shows up to give a letter to Doctor, showing no European country, including Switzerland, wants to stop the train. Afterward, Colonel calls the authorities in Basel Station to order a railway route. Meanwhile, on the train, Colonel's hunch comes true when Eklund, unaware of the disease he's carrying, touches people like a little girl and a baby. When he reaches the kitchen, he coughs out droplets of the disease on the newly cooked rice. Chamberlain happens to come across him and checks on Eklund to see if he's okay, but Eklund only stares at him and silently leaves. In Geneva, Colonel answers to his superiors. He plans to reroute and isolate the train to a former Nazi concentration camp in Poland. However, the train needs to cross over an abandoned bridge known as Cassandra Crossing. The Poland government assured him earlier that the railway is regularly checked, which therefore is safe to use. The call ends, and now they watch the computer screen display the list of passengers on the train. Colonel recognizes the rich lady's name. Just then, the major receives a call from Interpol. Interpol reports a narcotic trafficker is currently on the train. However, Colonel shows no interest in the trafficker, but rather in the delay on the train's radio operator. They've been contacting the train, but there's no response yet. Suddenly, Doctor exclaims at the sight of Chamberlain's name on the list. She believes it's good news that there's a doctor on board. Meanwhile, the chopper requested by Colonel finally sees the train. Inside the train, Jennifer notices the train doesn't stop at Basel Station, so she runs to the dining car and informs Chamberlain that the train didn't stop at the station because the police are forbidding the passengers to leave the train. Just in, the conductor approaches Chamberlain too and reports to him that an urgent call is waiting for him on the radio telephone. Chamberlain goes to the engine room. Corinnell informs him of the current problem, and then he describes Eklund as a Swedish man in his late 20s, sweaty and extremely pale. Upon hearing the description, Chamberlain sighs because he recognized Eklund in the kitchen an hour ago. So he informs Colonel that Eklund is certainly on board. 
Now they know Eklund is on the train, Colonel tasks Chamberlain to search for the terrorist. Chamberlain and the other two check the rooms, kitchen, and dining area, but they don't see him. They conclude Eklund is most probably hiding in the baggage car. As they return to the baggage car, they come across a man who knows how to speak Swedish, so they bring him along as a translator. Upon reaching the baggage car, they see Eklund barely moving around. The translator communicates with Eklund, but he can't reply back because of the sore throat. Chamberlain inspects Eklund's body afterward, when the translator suddenly remarks that they might as well speak with the dog in the cage. Chamberlain sees the dog and discerns the dog caught the disease because of the foam building up in its mouth. Above the train is the chopper, waiting for the train to stop. However, Colonel orders them to proceed with the operation because they can't risk the passengers walking around. The pilots have no choice but to follow. They reel down the net so Chamberlain and his team can transfer the dog and Eklund. The time is running and they need to act fast or else they're going to encounter the close tunnel ahead, making it impossible for the chopper to acquire and isolate Eklund. The team manages to put the dog into the net, but when it's time for them to transfer Eklund, it's too late because they're near a tunnel. They fail to transfer Eklund, but they manage to give the dog for observation and examination. After the attempt, Eklund falls into comatose, and Chamberlain calls Colonel on the radio. Chamberlain inquires the details about the disease, and Doctor replies that there's no antiserum yet, and there's about a 60% chance ray of infection. Doctor then lists down the early symptoms of the disease, such as common cold, sinus irritation, and sore throat. Chamberlain scoffs at the puny information. Regardless, he demands that a medical team and supplies be sent to the train to help them work on the potentially infected passengers. The call ends, and Chamberlain presumes Eklund only made contacts within the first-class cars, so they decide to lock the doors in the dining cars to prevent more people from catching the disease. In Geneva, Colonel allows Doctor to study the dog in the laboratory. Afterward, Colonel connects with the train's PA system and claims to be the train's authority. He fabricates a story, saying the train won't stop in Basel and Paris station because of the founded bombs planted by the terrorists in the railway. The announcement causes an uproar among the passengers. They demand to unload them at once on the next stop, but they're not allowed to leave. Among the angry passengers protesting is Navarro, who tries to bribe them to get him out, but even the conductor can't let him. Back on the train, many passengers are already displaying symptoms of the disease. In the dining car, the conductor informs the translator that the train is bound for Poland as instructed by Colonel. The translator suddenly goes quiet as if a bad memory triggers in his mind, and then mumbles that he can't go back again. Meanwhile, Chamberlain and Jennifer work together to search for the reported passengers with symptoms. Then they transfer them into an isolation car for examination and to prevent other passengers from catching the disease. That night, the train arrives in Nuremberg, where a medical team is waiting. The medical team in hazmat suits enters the train. They first seal the doors and windows, install an oxygen system for the passengers, then confiscate the passengers' belongings, and lastly, lock Eklund's corpse inside a tight-sealed coffin to be sent back to Geneva. While the medical team is busy, they announce in the PA system the real reason for their route. The translator uses the chance to escape from the train, but they catch him and immediately shoot him down. They ask him to return inside because they don't want to kill anybody. The translator returns inside, still dazed by the fact that he's returning to Poland. He meets Chamberlain, who tells him that there's a prepared hospital camp waiting for them in Poland, but the translator simply can't go back. He suddenly grabs a knife and tries to run away again, but Chamberlain and Jennifer stop him. Chamberlain is about to put the translator to sleep, but he begs not to bring him back because he remembers how his family died there during the Holocaust. They sympathize with the translator and accept his wish not to put him to sleep. The translator sits quietly while Jennifer walks out and cries because she understands what the translator means. The following day, Jennifer inquires the conductor about the details of Cassandra Crossing. The conductor says he's surprised the bridge is still intact, even after being abandoned since 1948. He remembers the locals living under the bridge evacuated, in fear that it's going to collapse above them. Therefore, the conductor believes it's unsafe for their train to cross over the bridge. Jennifer learns that it's risky to use the bridge, and Colonel in Geneva apparently knows about it too. But according to his superiors, they insist on using the bridge. Meanwhile, the rich lady calls for Chamberlain to help her lover. She fears Navarro is sick too, but when Chamberlain is about to inject him with the medication, he suddenly withholds the application and tells her that he's going to be fine. Chamberlain stops because he knows that Navarro is simply having withdrawal symptoms from narcotics and not from the disease. Meanwhile, Jennifer returns to the translator and tells him that she sympathizes with his dreadful past in Poland. After the doctor duties, Chamberlain reports to Colonel that there are currently 61 cases and two fatalities, but they died from respiratory and pulmonary causes and not from the plague. 
Chamberlain adds that there are no reported cases in the second class section, so he suggests stopping the train and separating the unaffected cars. However, Colonel still insists the whole train go into Poland. Suddenly, Doctor calls Colonel to show the dog is miraculously stabilizing and recovering from the plague. The discovery shows the plague isn't fatal as they thought. Back on the train, Jennifer wants to let Colonel know about the risk of crossing the bridge. However, it seems Colonel has no plan to allow them to stop the train. Chamberlain expresses his disappointment because of their neglect of the passengers' safety and lives. Just then, Colonel returns to the call, and Chamberlain relays the risk of crossing the bridge. They already laid out the testimonies of the translator and the conductor, but Colonel is firm with the decision to continue crossing the bridge, because the Poland government assured him yesterday that it's safe to use. Before ending the call, Colonel reminds Chamberlain that they'll reach Poland in four hours. Meanwhile, a priest-looking man enters the rich lady and her lover's bedroom. The lady thinks he is going to pray for her lover's health when the priest suddenly shows his identification card, revealing that he's an Interpol agent on an undercover mission. He's been on a two-month chase to Navarro, who's a contraband trafficker. Navarro quickly acts to his feet and kicks the agent in the neck. Then he threatens the lady with a gun pointing at her head. He brings her to the engine room. Navarro threatens everyone to drop him off the train or else he's going to blow her head to pieces. But the medical team leader doesn't want to stop the train, which angers Navarro more. So he destroys the radio telephone to imply that they don't have a boss to listen to anymore. Chamberlain knows how to deal with Navarro, so he incites him more to shoot everyone. He shouts at him to do what he wants, which surprises Navarro. He eventually gives in and collapses in tears. Chamberlain embraces Navarro and comforts him. Then he gives him back to the rich lady to rest in their bedroom. Suddenly, the previously infected passengers are now showing signs of recovery, like the dog brought to Geneva. In Geneva, Doctor discovers the cure for the play after examining the dog. She concludes the dog and possibly the passengers in the train can recover from the disease due to the enriched oxygen provided in an enclosed space. The only reason why the two terrorists died from the play is because the disease entered their bloodstreams through their open wounds, causing the disease to be more fatal. Doctor wants to update everyone on the train, but since the radio on their end is broken, they can't reach them at all. Doctor then begs for Colonel and the Major to at least provide a signal or warning to stop the train, but the two men simply stare at her. Back on the train, Chamberlain tells the medical team leader to stop the train, since the passengers are recovering. However, the leader doesn't listen. Chamberlain then tries to do it himself, but the medical team stops him and throws him out of the engine room. Chamberlain needs to save the people, so he initiates to seize the train themselves. He coordinates with other passengers to take over the train. They use the agent as bait, while the rest of the team quietly takes down medical staff members as they can. Once Chamberlain's team is fully equipped with weapons, they evacuate every passenger into the second-class section. Afterward, the medical team and the passengers face off through a shootout. Meanwhile, Navarro attempts climbing on the top of the roof to reach the engine room, but because of the high speed of the train and unstable floor, he can't go up. Chamberlain's team retreats to the dining car. Then Chamberlain asks the conductor if they can disconnect the second-class section from the first-class section. The conductor answers that each car owns a control box, but the electric coupling is underneath the kitchen floor. Chamberlain then goes into the kitchen, finding a way to break open the floor to access the coupling. However, Jennifer worries about the passengers in the first-class section if they manage to destroy the coupling. But Chamberlain assures her that once the train is cut in half, the first-class section will become light enough to cross over the bridge. Suddenly, Navarro suggests trying to reach the engine room through climbing the steel shutters outside. So the agent and Chamberlain cover for Navarro against the medical team while he climbs out of the window. However, a woman sees him and screams, alarming the guard to fire at Navarro outside. Navarro loses his grip and falls off the train. Meanwhile, Jennifer ties a flammable string on the gas tank, then brings it over to Chamberlain for ignition. Jennifer retreats to the second-class section after opening the tank's valve, while Chamberlain ignites a fire from a single match. However, the fire doesn't reach the gas filled kitchen, and there's no more source to create fire. Suddenly, the medical team throws a smoke bomb, and the agent saves the woman from the open fire. He carries her across the foggy hallway and into the second-class section, but he gets shot in the back and dies. Luckily, Chamberlain sees them quickly and saves the woman from the attacks. Meanwhile, the translator walks emotionlessly into the kitchen and ignites a fire, causing the kitchen to explode. The translator and the agent's sacrifice is worthwhile because the kitchen flooring is open. Chamberlain successfully destroys the coupling, and the two sections finally separate. The first-class section continues all the way to the Cassandra crossing, while the conductor puts the second-class section car on the brakes. Chamberlain hopes the first-class section crosses the bridge safely. 
However, the Cassandra crossing collapses because of the heavy weight of the train. The first class section successively falls into the chasm, killing all the passengers, medical team, and train operators inside. The movie ends with Chamberlain, Jennifer, the conductor, and other passengers leaving the train safely. Meanwhile in Geneva, Doctor sarcastically comments on how Colonel successfully sent the passengers into quarantine. Colonel's plan to hide the harbored disease in the destroyed train appears successful. However, they're unaware the second-class section has survived. Afterward, Colonel and Doctor exit the building, leaving the Major alone. The Major receives a call from Colonel's high-ranking officers to inform him that Colonel and Doctor are being monitored for an undisclosed reason. This is Daniel CC Movie Channel. Stay safe and enjoy your day.